Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Those are just great talks. You know, the only tip I would give you on braces is no dress fits everybody, right? No suit fits everybody. No shoe fits everyone. Go to a brace shop that's not just going to give you one type and let you try different types on. I don't know how easy that is for them, but that's what you'd want. Wouldn't it? Doesn't that make sense? Okay. So let me just put my timer on so I don't go over. Uh, my name's Glenn Pfeffer. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I just do foot and ankle. I'm at Cedars. We started a CMT center there a long time ago. Um, that's my email on the bottom. Please, if you're, you can get a copy of this talk um, somewhere easily. But if you email me, just shorter than long questions. You know, I'm usually trying to answer from my phone, so I don't want to be rude to anybody. Now I've seen this video at least a thousand times, and I keep putting it in, forgive me if some of you have seen it, but it so typifies communication issues. I don't know if this is the doctor or the patient, but how many people here have felt this way when they've gone to a doctor's office? Right? I mean, hasn't everybody felt that way at some, especially with CMT, you know, oh, I know what that is, that's the country music channel, or G, and, you know. um, I'm supposed to give you disclosures, I have absolutely no disclosures, again, I have to keep this slide in, but my grandchildren are heavily involved in the industry. Um, I would just point out, oh, let me go back there, I would just point out this to you here, where is that now, oh, there it is, okay. I would just point this out to you, it's very important. Recently, little Tim's been involved with Hanger. Um, it's just a joke, somebody took this seriously and said, how could you tattoo your grandchildren? I have no grandchildren. Um, one day, perhaps sooner than later, the way that CMTA has been going and other groups, um, this, won't, this will be an historical type of meeting and that we won't have CMT anymore. I, I suppose I look forward to the day very much when when a CMT young patient says to me, goodbye, Dr. Pfeffer, you know, we just don't have to need you anymore and the brace companies won't be needed anymore. But for now, for now, in many ways, for many patients, for many of you, CMT is a surgical disease, right? Uh, just for now. And I don't get that from my surgical mind itself. I get that from patients telling me that, right? Not for everyone, but that's why I'm here today. Um, Let's go back 100 years or more. We talked about this. You all know Charcot and Marie. Um, these are the French-looking guys. They said this was all from the spine. They were wrong. It came from the peripheral nerves. And this was Henry Tooth. My wife Mandy's in the back. She's British. She insists that I emphasize that he was British. Um, he had it right. Let's jump 100 years later, just about when I went into practice, and let's talk about my first patient. 1986, you know, and I was in the room, there were no windows, and a, a fit, beautiful, wavy-haired young woman was sitting on the bench. I came in, I thought, is this a sports injury? Uh, is she fracture her ankle? What's she here for? And she said to me, do you know what CMT is? And perhaps the greatest white lie that I've ever done in my life, I executed right then, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, of course and I'm still trying to get over this. And she said, well, good, because I'm gonna show you something no one else has ever seen. It's completely true. And in a windowless room, she took off one shoe and another, and she said, basically, I'm 22, I've never been on a date, my parents have never seen my feet, and then I looked in the corner, there were a pair of crutches. Well, I started that day to learn everything I could about CMT. She ended up with two operations. She went on years later to marry, and have children, and I owe that day and that white lie to why I'm sitting here, because that started me on the course to know everything that I could about CMT. So I guess that was a good white lie for me to partake in. Um, we know about this, wide spectrum of disease. It's enough to confuse me, so I'm sure, you know, unless you're a physician, you're confused by it too. So this is gonna be a really simple type of talk. I just don't, just, oops, sorry. Very, very simple. Some patients have advanced disease. I've seen some people in the room. They can be in wheelchairs. They can have problems with their hands. They can't put an ATM 
card into the machine, right? And they can't get it out. They can't open caps. Um, this is not who I'm talking about today. I can't, we'll hear about breathing problems, but this is not my world. Um, there are th multiple genotypes, right? So that means the genes that cause your problem or your problem or your problem may be highly varied. But what there is is fairly consistent phenotypes, right? We all have noses, we all have ears, even though our genetics are different, right? So for me, there are really only three types of CMT feet. Oh, of course, you'll raise your hand later and say, well, my foot's not like that. I understand that. But for the sake of getting through this and all of us holding on to some type of anchor, we have three types. You have people who are paralyzed below the knee, right? They don't have anything much going on. That's a hard problem, hard to brace. You have people who don't have any real activity below the knee or perhaps in the hip or more proximally, but their Achilles works. You heard the brace shop. <clears throat> those are the best people for those braces. You know, they're really good because they can spring along in a brace. And then you have the people in my world. These are the people with the deformed feet, the patients with the high arched, crooked feet, um, with no shock absorption when they're walking. Right? We, we all know that. Um, there it is. This is probably 70% of Charcot Marie Tooth feet. Right? And these are the feet that I'm talking about right now for the next, or well, whatever it is, tw my timer went off, so keep me on time, um, for the next 20 minutes or so. Okay, now there are three key points. Again, I've reduced this. This is a view of 15,000 feet. We're not looking right up at a magnifying glass, right? But there are key points that I think are germane to this topic for all of you. The first is big problems don't start small. A mother wrote me email, a text recently, I, she has my phone, and she said, I'm sorry to be such a nudge about this, but I just don't know what to do for my 14-year-old. And I texted her back, and I said, don't be silly. You're doing just what a mother should do, right? She's trying to get an answer, but she's having a hard time. There's such disparity of care. So I would just say with this in line, for every mother, for every father with CMT or knows someone with CMT, um, pay attention to it. Don't let the big problem get small, and we're going to talk more about that. Don't put a crooked foot into a brace. We can debate this as long as you like. I'm allowed to have my point of view, right? Somebody here is Democrat, somebody is Republican. But my point of view is you don't take a crooked foot that looks like a live oak and stick it into a brace. It doesn't make any sense. And a deformed foot causes pain when you're walking. Well, I, I don't want to have surgery because my main problem is pain. And I know my foot's crooked. And I don't think the pain will go away. Nonsense. It won't go away, but we'll talk more about that. Now, these were always my ideas, and something remarkable happened two weeks ago. The Shark and Tooth Association essentially gave me money to set up a think tank in Chicago of 12 of the smartest foot and ankle people in the world. And we sat for eight hours on a Sunday. Several of them texted back and said, I missed all these football games. Um, <laughs> but they, everyone learned something, and if we all agreed uh, we agreed on what to not agree about, but these were three points that we certainly all agreed with. All right. Now, what causes a foot deformity? Don't fall asleep on this slide. It's just very simple. It's this. It's imbalance. Right? If you take one strong muscle and pull it against a weaker muscle, it doesn't work out very well. Right? Now, Vera, we'll go through it quickly, because it doesn't really matter what these are called. The tibialis anterior is what lifts up your ankle. The peroneus longus is what stabilizes the side of your foot. The tibialis anterior gets weak. That's foot drop. The other one doesn't. That starts to cause a deformity, right? One's pulling, and the other's not. And you can see what happens to the front of the foot. This goes down, and you start walking on your big toe on that side of the foot. A lot of people know that. You, can know, you may not know why. There are other things that are happening simultaneously, which is why it's such a perfect storm for the CMT patient. The peroneus brevis is what stabilizes the ankle. If you went around and got everyone's peroneus brevis cut, they'd all sprain their ankles every single step. Why don't you sprain your ankle every step? Because it happened very slowly on you, and your brain got used to it. Your brain accepted it. Perhaps it shouldn't have, but it has you know, at this point, and that's why you can still walk. And by what I say, perhaps it shouldn't, maybe there should have been intervention earlier before you got to this stage. But this is what happens. You get this twisted in foot. The posterior tibial tendon is that muscle, it's strong, and the one on the outside, the brevis, is weak. We all know this. 
even if you don't have this, everyone's looked at a CMT site. As the ankle dorsiflexures, what lifts up the ankle, foot drop, weaken, the toe extensors start to pull harder. Look what's happening. This person can't lift up their ankle except with their toes. What do you think happens over time with that? Not such a big deal, right? Unless you're a 16-year-old girl who's looking forward to life, getting married in a cute shoe, right? not wearing a sneaker, not tripping. Big problems start small. Just remember that. I guess that's a silly slide to put up. It certainly caused me a lot of grief trying to get this high-definition slide into this talk. But it's really the case, please. For, I don't know why, really, but for decades, we've let CMT problems get out of control. You mustn't let it happen. Now, how does it begin? How do you know where this is starting? Well, there's something called a peekaboo heel. Right? Look, see the heel, how it's in a little bit? Someone in this room has a teenager with just that heel in a little bit. It's just beginning. Pneumonias don't usually start overnight. They start with a little cold. Now, that'll progress. What should we do with this fellow? He's 18. He walks pretty well, right? He's not in a wheelchair. Should we operate on him? He certainly doesn't want to brace. But then you have to talk to him. And we do talk to him. He says, well, I trip over. Mom says he has no self-confidence. All his friends are out distancing him. Dad's wondering why he can't play baseball the way his brothers can. Right? Not horrible foot. But certainly a foot could be made better if it were flat on the ground. What would you do with that foot? He'd say, well, I don't not sure, but I'd, I'd want to take that heel out of that position. I'd want to make it flatter than it is, right? Custom orthotics may help, but where is that foot going? That's the issue. Something like that is what it'll go to. I can't say for sure, and I don't know when to pull the plug, but don't let it get there. Why was this foot allowed to get there? How many people in the room, my wife's always on me about this, are going to wait till they have a heart attack before they take care of their heart? Andy? After she wants me to exercise every day. Why would we wait till we have a heart attack of the foot, right? Keep your eyes open. Maybe it's too late for you in terms of preventing things, but we want a balanced foot. We don't want this walking on the side of your foot with chronic pain. We don't want this with ulcers, calluses. Don't you think that hurts? Mm -hmm. The bone broke there. Just walking on it too much, 17 years old, right? The ankles go. The ankles become lax, the ankles become arthritic. They come to my office, and it's just really too late to do something wonderful. We can help, but it's not the wonderful type of surgery that we can do earlier on. Braces versus surgery, you've had some excellent talks about it. I gave you my tip about braces, but I want to make this clear. A, the CMTA would not have me up here if I were some knife-happy surgeon, right? I have been vetted. I've been vetted with them, and I've been vetted with hundreds of patients. Go on blogs, go online. I'm not an aggressive surgeon, but I don't want to wear a brace the rest of my life if I don't have to. I don't wear, wear, want to wear a big brace the rest of my life if I can wear a smaller one. But braces are great for certain people. Take a look at her. You've seen this on the previous guy from The Hanger movie. She really can't walk. Her foot's unstable. But what's the key message? It's flat on the ground. It's not crooked. Look what happens in a brace. The Allard braces are great. Hanger has an array of braces. This happens to be a Helios brace. Look how transformative that is for her life. I would never consider operating on that person. I would never do an ankle fusion for a foot drop because the braces are wonderful. So just remember, the braces are great probably actually for at least three quarters of the patients who have feet like this. My only objection is I want people to have an option. How many patients have I referred to a brace maker compared to how many I've gotten back referred to me? It's probably 100 to 1. Go get a brace. Oh, you'll do very well with a brace. Try to avoid surgery. Maybe just a handful of people over 30 years have come back. Why is that? All right. This gal from Australia, should she be in a brace? Her foot's crooked, it's sticking there. What pain, she's been told there's nothing to do. These people with braces, with feet that don't move, they don't move because they're either arthritic or the young man on the right is because those tendons are tight. Don't do this. 
you're not trying to push a square hole into a round peg. Even if you take the round peg, which is the brace, and make it look more like the foot, you do not want a foot like that because it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse, just like this structure got worse over 500 years. 500 years, maybe six. This was slowly collapsing. Her foot didn't take that long to get, right? I hope you appreciate how difficult that slide was today. <laughs> That's what got me in trouble. <laughs> but again, this is, not, this is not something you want. Why in 2018 do we still have somebody like this who's been told that there's nothing to do for her? Let me turn my... There we go. There's nothing to do for her. You just have to wear a brace. Here's little... Um, Little guy I just operated on. You see his feet. He's 12 years old. They will never progress. We'll give him a flat foot. We're operating on the next foot in a few weeks. Right? It, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's just common sense. If we can balance those muscles and get those foot flat. It's not the surgeon telling you this. It's just common sense telling you this. You know? Now, so how do you decide? What do you do? In my office, whether come, someone comes in for a bunion or a CMT surgery or a flat foot surgery where they have a problem with too flat a foot, I always tell them the same thing and I would tell you the same thing. And if nothing else, I would leave you with these words. The day you wake up, the day your child wakes up, and you know that you're not going to live with this foot the rest of your life, that's the day to give me a call. It's really simple. It's hard, though because you get used to it, don't you? It's, it's like slowly, slowly, an insidious decline, right? I have a foot problem. I had a foot problem for 40 years. I had it operated on 13 years ago. I went to 10 doctors in New York City. My father was a professor of surgery. He took me to the best. Some thought I was crazy. No one made the diagnosis. I cried after soccer practice. I wore orthotics that hurt my foot more. And only when I was president of the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, that year that I say, this is enough. I'm making my own diagnosis. I got an MRI. The radiologist called me back and said, there's nothing wrong with your foot. Stunning. But I sent him a lot of work. So he must have gone back to look at the MRI. And this is completely true. David Stoller in San Francisco. So he called me back about half an hour later. He goes, oh, Glenn, you know, you do have a giant congenital spur in the hind foot that prevents your foot from moving. I almost collapsed. And it, you know, just the way that you might if you found out that you, all those 40 years of problems were from a genetic disease, not because you weren't too tough, not because you weren't the apple of dad's eye. So that's my advice to you. There's no uniform surgical approach. We're trying to get that. The paper of the group we met will come out next year. It'll be available to you on what the consensus was of these brilliant people. Um, it's a hard problem. People come from all over the United States and they haven't had any uniform opinion, and they're depressed, they're frustrated. I just saw a gal from Wyoming, she's 17, she said she wanted her foot amputated. The mother said, try one more time. But this kind of frustration leads to just despair. Right? Now, we put 100,000 pounds on our stress in a mile of walking, at least I do, well, maybe more with my foot problem. How much stress do you think's put on the foot like that? Million pounds? Do you think that hurts? If you want your friends to understand what it's like to have CMT, just tell them to go walk on the side of their foot on concrete for maybe an hour, right? Certainly some of your pain, CMT pain, is from a neuropathy, but certainly some of it's from just walking on a cockamamie foot. So you've got to bring that foot around and put it flat on the ground. Don't put it in a brace, get it flat. So what are the primary goals of, few, of surgery? And we'll conclude. One, you'd like to preserve as much motion as you can and not fuse joints, but it's okay to fuse joints sometimes, especially if you're older. I fused two joints in a 13-year-old. It was okay. It was the best option because you don't want to come back again and again. You don't want a failure. Too depressing, right? You want it to work. Whoop, let me go back. Sorry. Um, you want a foot that's flat on the ground. You want to balance the muscle pull of the foot, and you want to minimize the brace. Nobody wants to be in a brace. Even the president of Hanger doesn't want you in a brace if you can avoid it. Or at least to minimize the brace, right? We'd all like to be in a little less cumbersome brace. We want to, with surgery, take the foot on the left and turn it to the one on the right. You want to take the foot on the right, here, the left side here, that was before surgery, and turn it into one that's been operated on. This person may need a brace 
but they won't need the same type of brace. The toes need to be corrected. You can fit into a shoe. There's a tremendous disparity of what needs to be done. Um, I was trained as a hand surgeon. We do these operations under a microscope. We do use blocks, which is wonderful for you because you'll have no pain for a day or so, perhaps more if you're lucky. We take the tendons that are too strong and we transfer them to the tendons that are weak. We take the bones that are deformed and have become deformed over time and we make wedge cuts in them and we move the bones around. It's a lot. I'm not going to minimize it. I saw online somebody said, not about me. He had the audacity to tell me I was going to have screws in my foot and have pins put in my foot and have the tendons moved. You're darn right that's what you're going to have done. It's a surgery that takes me three or four hours to do. It's orthopedics. That's what orthopedic surgeons that are foot and ankle specialists at CMT do. You know, so it's creepy. But it's, but it's, but it's, 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 one, it's wonderful. Um, wedges. So you have to just sort of close your eyes, trust, and jump in. Maybe like the first time you went swimming, you know. Um, I just want to show you this. Something as simple as how to move the heel is very complicated. Here's the heel. You can see this is the right foot from behind. And what we do is we take a wedge out and we move the heel over, right? So it's not so crooked anymore. But it's tricky. It's so tricky that there's tremendous disparity in the country and differing opinions. So what we did at Cedars was some research. We took three-dimensional CAT scans of CMT feet and we looked at them with 3D prints. And this, this, this study that we did was, was published. We have a series of them. Another article just came out. And I'm just so proud that it was done with the Shark and Tooth Association research grant. And what we showed basically was if you take this print, those little knobs sticking on the top or bottom are just to hold it in the block, but that's Sarah's left hind foot. Right here is, look at that, there you go. That's her heel, and that's the ankle up here, all right? And with this grant from the CMTA, we actually won a Game Changer Award at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And this study was shown to be one of the three most significant studies to change orthopedic care in the future. And it, not so much to tout my own horn as to show you how misunderstood this problem is, to be able to get an award for such a simple study. You know. um, we used special customized jigs, and we made all sorts of different cuts on the heel in those plastic models, and we determined which was the best. Now, I want you to close your eyes because this is a real surgical study, and so even if you might be squeamish or someone once told you were squeamish, close your eyes. Otherwise, I'm just gonna show you what our study did. This is the foot of someone whose heel has been cut, and with the unique technique that we developed, we can move the heel anywhere we want. The frustration of orthopedic surgeons around the country is we can't put the heel where we want, so the surgery fails, but here we can. So thanks to the CMTA for that research grant. Um, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> All right, to conclude, this is what we want, isn't it? That right foot's gonna be operated, has, is about to be operated on the left foot was. It's balanced, it moves up and down. Here a foot, you see the toes ex pulling hard, the deformity that's occurring. She was just so unhappy with those feet in the front. But look what we could turn it into with appropriate operation. No brace normal sneakers, got an email, Dr. Pfeffer, I just walked around Disneyland for 12 hours with my boyfriend. And here's someone nearest and dearest to my heart, Sarah. She came to me, she said, all I want to be able to do in my life is walk down the high school aisle at graduation without holding onto my father's arms. That's all she wanted, nothing more. Well, we accomplished that. We were able to get her to walk down the aisle. She was able to fit into cute shoes for the first time, and I called her about five years later, and I said, asked her how she was doing. And she, said, Doc, and she said, Dr. Pfeffer, I just got back from a trip in London where we'd walk 10 kilometers, very British, 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers, I guess in my, miles in Britain, right? But anyway, she said 10 kilometers a day, and she said, I'm working in a pizzeria on my way to law school. I have a boyfriend, we go out dancing. So she's not alone, all of these kids, adults, Chicago, Israel, she was born in Russia, Texas, Boston, young and old, take their feet, if they can, and we make them flatter and more balanced. Um, the key to this 
that, and which is really remarkable to me, is we're there in the first post-op visit. The patient's scared. They know they have five or six or seven incisions. They have multiple sutures to take out. There might be pins sticking out of their toes, right? And they don't know what's going to happen, right? But you take the dressing off. You'll see it here in my last video. And I'll say, please look at your foot. And people don't often want to look at their foot. This young woman didn't want to look at her foot. She didn't want surgery. She had to argue with her dad about it. But we eventually get them to look at their foot, however kind of bloody and gruesome it is. And this is what we aim for. There we are. And the foot goes up and down. And she turned to her father and she said, Daddy, I, I want the other foot done too now. How can that be better? Thank you very much.